Thank you very much, Ombudsman. Um, now, the uh, next session, the first session is on uh, the topic of uh, a resilient institution, a turbulent system, of, uh, a turbulent administrative system. And uh, we have uh, the two authors of a, a paper that I have been preparing on this, Jan uh, Letrand, and Alain Ankrechtwiller. So, who is going to speak first? Me? You are going. I go right. on. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, so we have um, decided to chair, share this uh, talk, split it in two, and uh, I guess our task is partly to offer some conceptual step back and offer some con context for, for the seminar, and in addition, so I, I will do that, uh, and in addition provide some, info, uh, some observations, some data, and um, and uh, that will, uh, and Treat will, will do that. Um, these are reflections from two different fields of study. Um, one field of study is the study of the European administrative system, which have already been touched on, upon by Hervik. So I will, I will come back and try to tie in a little bit about what you commented on in my, uh, my first part. And secondly, so I, I'm, I'm a, perhaps a specialist in European administrative system. Secondly, we have the field of European accountability landscape, which Anshit is a specialist on. So she is better to talk about that than I am. Let me see if I, yeah. This is a, some kind of a picture that suggests at least something about we, what we are supposed to talk about and write about. Um, and it gives an overview of these two fields of study and what we are interested in in our contribution. And together, I think we, we mark turbulent context in the middle there, I think uh, that administrative order and accountability landscape as a together somehow uh, provide some turbulence to the system um, as a whole. Uh, so we are going to introduce the European Administrative Order separately and then the accountability landscape and hopefully together they will provide some thoughts about uh, the broader context. And finally we're going to talk a little bit about the, cap about the capacity of the European Ombudsman. So this will be the overview. I will introduce some concepts on turbulence, which I have worked on recently, <coughs> not in this context, but in another context, but I hope it would be of some uh, value here as well. And secondly, say something about the evolving Euro EU administrative order and how it um, go across levels and how we can think about it and what, con what, what uh, um, consequences this administrative order might have for an institution such as this one. And secondly, Antrit will introduce the accountability landscape, the broader context of accountability holders, account holders, and also the role of the European Ombudsman in that broader landscape. So hopefully we could br bring in some context to, to the seminar um, as a whole. So first, Crisis has already been mentioned. This is a, has been a period of crisis, and there has been a lot, a, a big literature on crisis as well. What causes crisis and what consequences does it derive? Well, the term of turbulence that we have tried to conceptualize is not a, con, a, ter, a, a, a term about crisis. So crisis is something that happens to organizations and, or happens to environment in certain periods of time <coughs> as shocks. Well, term, uh, turbulence in our thinking is more of a generic property, something that is enduring. Uh, it is, um, uh, we, we define turbulence as related to the interaction of demands for action. And a turbulence occurs when the interaction of demands for, uh, for action is experienced as 
variable, inconsistent, unexpected, unpredictable, uncertain. Um, or when actors in the systems perceive uh, these demands in this way. So, so the, the demand for action might be objectively a variable or they might be perceived that way. And the challenge, I guess, is given that uh, there is turbulence around or perceived that way, the challenge is how to govern under turbulence. And in that respect, how to hold account under turbulence. So, um, turbulence in that respect is not the same as, same as a crisis, which hits. Crisis, a crisis might perhaps um, visualize a turbulent system. It's like a, perhaps the one metaphor could, or one, one parallel could be global warming. You don't see it until it's, it's uh, triggered by some happens, or it's uh, like a tsunami. You don't see it uh, at the ocean, but when it uh, comes to the shore, you see it. So, so the systems might be turbulent, but you don't see it. Secondly, turbulence is more than something outside organizations. It's something more than environmental property. That brings me to the second. The, we, uh, we think of turbulence as three different things. The standard thinking about turbulence is that it is something outside organizations or outside systems. It's something about the environment, this, this one. And that is not to the, how, how we think about it uh, in, in the paper. Uh, it is uh, in that second thinking, it's uh, something out external to organizations. Uh, and that's... Uh, in a sense, organizations are passive takers of premises from uh, the environment. So given that the environment is turbulent, organizations have to adapt in some way or another. And this could be seen as the uh, conventional view in much literature. Uh, the second idea about um, turbulence is that um, organizations themselves can be internally turbulent. And particularly as a political scientist uh, studying public sector organizations with political leadership. These are specific types of organizations that have brought conflict into, it's embedded into the system, into the organization more than in private sector organizations. So we can talk about embedded turbulence into the rules, into the structures, into the staffing, recruitment, whatever. So this would be our approach. Um, from from uh, from from so looking at the European administrative order, as I will show in the next picture, as internally turbulent. And this, then we have thought about there might be a third one. Turbulence of scale, we have called it. It has to do with it caused by the interface between organizations and the environment. Something happens between organizations and the environment, and perhaps we can think about th this also as turbulence, more or less turbulence. Where the challenge is if, if it's a mismatch between what is called upon from the environment and what answers the organization can give. Perhaps there's a turbulence of scale. So what happens at one level, I think this brings uh, the thinking from the from mentioned from Hervik, what, ha what happens at one level or in one organization causes problems at another level or in another organization? So a, go a good local solution could be a bad solution on a broader scale, okay? So this perhaps could be our additional uh, um, uh, model. Uh, and what we have called the coordination dilemma could be also a, ca a case of that. If member states want to coordinate their policies, their systems, but there is also a need for coordination across levels, there might be a dilemma of or a turbulence of scale, where that it, it does not necessarily go together. So, going more concrete, I give you two pictures of the European administrative system, a, a traditional one and the, and, the, and the evolving new one. So this feature, uh, feature one is the, what we can think of as the traditional uh, non-turbulent uh, EU administrative system with two levels, an EU level and a national level. 
uh, where we have, we can think about this as uh, we have two rather separate levels of, of uh, policy formulation, policy implementation, accountability, and so on. This is the traditional intergovernmental picture of the EU, where we have territorial specialization, and uh, it assumes that member states have some degree, or a high degree even, of administrative sovereignty, control of their own administration. Member states have their own agencies, and these agencies are under control of the cabinet and the ministries. Uh, in this picture also, we can talk about um, an indirect multi-level administration. Indirect in the sense that when the EU implements public policy at the national level, it goes via ministries, via national political control, so via the accountability uh, mechanisms at the national level. So member states keep some ultimate control. Um, and in this picture also, perhaps we can say that accountability is a one-leveled game. Accountability um, at the national level is a question for national institutions. And at, it's a basically a national level uh, process. So the question is if this model is perhaps overtaken or at least supplemented by the second one, where we have a system based on sectorial specialization, not territorial. It's not member state by member state, but it's sliced into uh, sectoral fields. And this would, uh, this would be a picture of a turbulent system, at least as seen from member states. If they have this first picture in mind, the second one would be challenging. <coughs> it would challenge administrative sovereignty in this picture, agencies at the national level might have direct relationships with their DG, partner DG, their agencies, their networks of agencies. Not going via the member states' ministries, they bypass them. So it might challenge the sovereignty of administration. And it might perhaps, you tell me, challenge national accountability as well which is perhaps more relevant for this session. <clears throat> it challenges the indirect model of political control. So this is a model of direct multi-level administration with interconnected actors, interconnected institutions across levels. It assumes a high degree of coordination across levels. We can talk about agencies as double-hatted, they have one hat as a national agency and one hat as a European agency. And as indicated by Hervik also, I, I think the question from this model is what consequences does such a model give for account holders such as the Ombudsman? What role does the Ombudsman play in this system? If this system is what we see. Is the Ombudsman, is the Ombudsman uh, can it cope with this system and how to cope with it? Is it by networks of, as suggested already, perhaps? There are two preconditions for this second model to, to emerge. First is uh, one pre um, condition at the national level, that is hiving of authority from ministerial department to agencies, or in practice, new public management type of reforms which has made agencies quite autonomous. Well, that make, them, uh, sorry, that make them available for capture by external institutions, such as the European Commission, such as the EU agencies, and so on. It makes um, uh, autonomous agencies available for co-optation or being borrowed or co-opted elsewhere. The second uh, condition, uh, precondition is center formation at the European level, some capacity at the EU level in order to capture these um, relative autonomous agencies. And in the European, at the European level, it is particularly the European Commission in relationship also with EU agencies, 
that is might be able to do, to do this. And we have a lot of studies suggesting how the Commission, particularly the Commission DGs and their agencies, are tightly interconnected. And together, we can talk about executive center formation at the EU level. And uh, my sl last slide, uh, before I leave the floor to Anshrit, is uh, what consequences can such a system give, uh, such a direct EU administration give for public policy making, politics and accountability? First of all, we can talk about turbulence in public policy. In this second model, the turbulent model, you get more uniform implementation of and more uniform practicing of EU politics and law. So it's, it increases the potential for <coughs> uniformity, which might be seen as a good thing. And uh, all this as flip side, less leeway for national adjustments. And it might be considered as an, or experienced as turbulent for member state administrations and, and national account holders. Secondly, turbulence in politics. This second model gives less re, uh, room for national administrative coordination if they want so. So if member states want to control more, more want to coordinate their agencies, it might be less way, a leeway for, to do that. So coordination across level leave less room for coordination at the national level. You cannot have both. So this might be seen as turbulent for member states, a challenge for their administrative sovereignty. Second, uh, finally, turbulence in accountability. There are more actors involved in accountability uh, and less clarity about democratic control. Uh, and this might give overall system turbulence. So if, as already mentioned, account holders merely look after their regulators at each level and do not have the networked system uh, uh, in sight and don't have the multi-level outlook that might, might be a problem or a challenge to cope with. So this is my notes, uh, in introductory notes to some context and I s switch the slide to Antrit and give you the technicalities. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Because my uh, story is quite complementary to uh, Jarle's uh, story, he's uh, uh, very much focused on the evolving administrative order, but along the uh, administrative uh, accountability uh, order, we, you see an uh, accountability landscape rising, an accountability landscape uh, due to that the centre formation at the. Uh, uh, EU is uh, uh, at the supranational level, and uh, that makes that uh, accountability institutions are needed. Uh, usually, there is the idea that accountability is uh, uh, linked to one institution, but uh, the idea of an accountability landscape is uh, grounded on the idea that it's a system, a system of accountability institutions working together, and this system is evolving, so it's not a static kind of uh, uh, landscape, it's continuous, continuously changing. Uh, and it's changing along six rudiments or six elements. Uh, the obligations, the institutions and arrangements that have been uh, built up in the accountability institutions in the uh, EU, standards, Without standards, there is no accountability. Relationships, practices, and networks. And I will uh, step in all of these uh, six uh, elements with you in this uh, uh, presentation. Starting with the uh, obligations, we see that uh, building the EU means that there is a, a, a lot of obligations uh, dealt with in the treaties about who's accountable to who, about what, and uh, we see a, a rise of a lot of uh, uh, code of conducts, we see ethical frameworks, we see whistleblowing acts, transparency initiatives, all uh, aimed to make clear what the obligations are of executive bodies to, uh, to give account uh, about what. So these obligations is actually the basis on which this accountability landscape is built. Uh, then we see that there have been in the uh, 
weight. That in uh, the landscape, there are several institutions. We see uh, it started with the European Parliament and the European Court of Justice in 1985, giving shape to uh, uh, legal and political accountability, although it was not really political, it was more of a kind of a sort of advisory board. Uh, but uh, during time, several institutions are added to this accountability landscape, like uh, the European Court of Auditors, the European Ombudsman, the Integrity Office, OLAF, and uh, with the Lisbon Treaty, we see the role of the national parliaments added in this accountability uh, landscape, all uh, taking a, a different part of accountability, all performing a different type of accountability, where uh, the parliament and uh, the national parliament is more uh, directed to <coughs> shaping political accountability. Uh, the judicial part is uh, sort of um, shaped by the uh, European Court of Justice. And we have the uh, financial, which is uh, more performed by the auditors, uh, 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 auditor institution. And the European Ombudsman is performing or directing more into the administrative accountability, all also shaping different standards uh, of what is uh, important in this accountability landscape. Political responsibility for the European Parliament, uh, the rule of law for judicial uh, uh, accountability, looking at the financial, then it's uh, sound financial management. Administrative accountability is uh, given by good administrative behavior. And we have the OLAF uh, trying to shape the integrity as a, a, an important standard. So uh, the accountability landscape of uh, the EU is evolving by adding new institutions, by adding and shaping these standards, and by uh, uh, filling in the different types of accountability, political, administrative, financial, and legal accountability. Um, what is uh, the result is that there are a lot of relations. There's a proliferation of relationships between the executive bodies in the EU and we have the uh, uh, accountability institutions all trying to uh, um, shape this accountability relationship by asking for information, by asking for reports, by uh, debating, by sanctioning sometimes. And some of the uh, accountability relationships are quite evolved. If you look at the Court of Justice, uh, has a strong uh, accountability relationship with the European Commission and the Council of Ministers. Um, but we see also that the blue political accountability is evolving strong from the European Parliament nowadays uh, when it comes to the Commission and uh, still evolving on the other parts. Uh, and that's uh, also uh, the case for the national parliaments, the new come round the block uh, uh, in the Lisbon Treaty. And looking at the Court of Auditors, shaping the financial accountability, uh, which is evolving, and uh, the administrative accountability of the uh, Ombudsman. So uh, different relationships for accountability researchers. This is a, a, a very uh, broad area to research. Uh, and different types and strengths of accountability which have been involved and which are still um, evolving. Uh, focusing on the European Ombudsman, we see that uh, part of the accountability landscape is, of course, shaped by practices, by activities. It's not only formal accountability in the book, it's also uh, that was uh, out there. Um, and this is uh, from the annual report, uh, giving an overview of how uh, uh, accountability is uh, increasing, eh? how uh, the number of inquiries of the European Ombudsman has increased during the years. And that is not uh, atypical for the uh, European Ombudsman, because if we compare it to the uh, other accountability institutions in the EU, looking at the court, the European Parliament, the auditors, the all of uh, the integrity office, then it's clear that if we make an index and see how uh, acti activities have increased during the years, that there is uh, a lot of activity uh, concentrated on accountability going on there. Um, and especially 
uh, comparing uh, European Parliament and our Court of Auditors and our Ombudsman with uh, the uh, Court, we see that uh, at this new areas of accountability, administrative and political accountability, these uh, activities are really uh, larger than, for instance, in the area of the legal accountability, which is more or less stable. So uh, accountability activities are shifting to uh, political and administrative areas, which is uh, logically, because the EU started as a legal kind of inst uh, institution and is now more getting a sort of professionalized and politicized uh, shape up. Uh, and that's reflected in the activities of uh, all these accountability institutions. Uh, finally, what is uh, important also in the accountability landscape is not only the individual organizations, no, it's also that they cooperate, cooperate at certain, se several levels. First, um, the horizontal level, uh, the European Ombudsman uh, cooperating with the European Parliament, with the European Court, uh, but as well, and that's already mentioned here, is the, um, the vertical relationships between the institutions that the European Parliament is cooperating with national parliaments to give shape to political accountability and that the European Court does that with the national courts and the European Ombudsman is having this uh, with the uh, uh, national uh, Ombudsman. So um, for an effective accountability landscape, these kind of networks are very uh, in, uh, important. Looking at the uh, ability, the capacity of the European Ombudsman to um, contribute to this uh, accountability landscape, to um, see uh, in what uh, aspect of respect this uh, institution can contribute to accountability, uh, we think that there are three, three elements which are very in, uh, important for um, the accountability capacity of the European Ombudsman. That is uh, results, performing uh, outcomes uh, uh, in connection to the mandate. That's uh, resilience, being a durable uh, institution, a sustainable institution which is able to adapt to uh, changing circumstances. And uh, we have uh, legitimacy and that it's uh, having a, a place within the uh, institution in political order in which it's uh, uh, operating. Okay, well, looking at the results, I have already shown how uh, active uh, the Ombudsman was in uh, safeguarding, which is, of course, uh, one of the main, institution, main uh, uh, aims of the Ombudsman, safeguarding good administrative behavior, but we see at the other, uh, uh, other aspect of um, outcomes that the Ombudsman is very active in shaping standards, giving uh, a, a definition of good administrative behavior because when the Ombudsman started, there was not a clear uh, idea of what good administrative behavior was, but also in uh, norms of transparency, in making a, a public service uh, 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 code. So shaping standards and safeguarding, these are the core from the results uh, uh, determining the accountability capacity of the European Ombudsman. If you look at the resilience, uh, the, the degree to which this uh, institution is able uh, to become a sustainable organization or institution, then we must say that um, there are several elements that are important for this resilience, uh, for this uh, sustainability. Uh, it's the autonomy, which already have been discussed, the independence of the organization. It's leadership, it's uh, a way it uh, has a, a visual, uh, um, visual, what is it? Representation outside. And it's uh, adaptability, the, uh, the way it's uh, uh, coping with change, coping with turbulence, coping with uh, new kind of uh, uh, circumstances. And it's, again, the network integration, which is very important because um, uh, effective accountability holding 
uh, requires nowadays that there is a cooperation at the horizontal level and the cooperation with the European Parliament is of course uh, one of the uh, core kind of actors in which European Ombudsman is uh, working with. Uh, but also again the uh, vertical uh, kind of uh, uh, co cooperation between the, the national ombudsman and Jarl and I are still working on this uh, paper because we have uh, different kind of visions. Uh, he has uh, uh, the idea that uh, the two-tire model, the national model and the uh, European level model is a very um, um, is, is, is inhibiting a, an effective accountability uh, network, uh, where I'm, whereas I'm more positive about the uh, uh, potential of uh, the, uh, um, uh, the network to become a more efficient and effective accountability uh, uh, tool. Finally, legitimacy. Legitimacy, what's the role of the uh, uh, European Ombudsman in this uh, uh, political new evolving order that's uh, casting administrative justice, of course. Um, and we have already uh, heard about different models and the proactive model in which the Ombudsman is uh, uh, dealing with fire prevention and the more reactive model in which the Ombudsman is uh, concentrating on firefighting and fire watching. Um, well, there is indeed by shaping standards, by being very proactive, uh, a shift towards uh, the role of a system fixer, of a fire uh, preventer, um, that uh, can sometimes be, uh, well, tensions, uh, give tensions with the other role, uh, being uh, the, the, um, the citizen defender, the, the complaint uh, redresser, might be, uh, uh, might be uh, in part, there might be a sort of tension between these two roles because being too proactive can also uh, mean that uh, the Ombudsman uh, sometimes uh, becomes uh, as a, uh, an institution with a reputation of being uh, always knocking on the door for more, 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 but when it comes to the complaints, it also has uh, impact of uh, how uh, how uh, um, proactive you have been in the past. So that, that, that's the, uh, the, the small warning on this uh, anniversary that two roles sometimes have to be uh, um, very much in balance before uh, you can really be successful on both uh, fields. To conclude, to conclude, in this uh, multi-layered uh, accountability landscape, uh, which is uh, nowadays driven by politicization and professionalization in which we see the different new institutions fulfilling and shaping this political and uh, uh, administrative accountability which were in the uh, traditional setup of the European Union not really uh, uh, there. We see in this turbulence context uh, that uh, the uh, accountability capacity of the European Ombudsman has been uh, has been firm and that we uh, uh, expect that this uh, capacity will be evolving in the coming 20 uh, years uh, more than, uh, than we have seen now. Okay, um, I'm... I'm done with my presentation. <laughs> And I uh, want to have a, s a small note because um, there is uh, one problem with my voice. I have one vocal cord, which sometimes uh, sounds as if I'm very nervous, but it's not nervous. It's the, the uh, amount of uh, noise I have to produce with one vocal cord, which makes it sometimes difficult to talk. So that was the final note at the end of the uh, uh, presentation. Okay, thank you. Thank you, and uh, your last explanation has shown us another example of turbulence which uh, one has to deal with. Uh, I would like to insist that uh, Hoffman and I, uh, when preparing this uh, workshop, wanted to have a truly pluridisciplinary uh, work 
We will see whether the discussion makes it interdisciplinary, because as we know, it's not always easy to talk from one discipline to another. I'm uh, happy enough to have been introduced to the concepts of turbulence long ago by a good friend and colleague of mine, Les Metcalf, who probably you have read and have, has written a few things about this. Uh, most lawyers would not, uh, but this does not impede. On the contrary, I think we uh, should use the 15 minutes which come really to have an exchange in the perspective of uh, enriching uh, our colleagues for their paper with questions. I would just, as a lawyer, indicate two small points. I saw something on the last slide about administrative justice which was not clear to me, but maybe we will discuss it in the break. And mainly, uh, the way you have been using, uh, between inverted commas, uh, direct administration might create problems with the way lawyers use direct administration. It needs for a definition, but that's another story. So I open the floor and uh, questions, suggestions, comments. Uh, Alain Rosas, maybe you want to uh, say something also on uh, Bavarian Lager. Or <laughs> between Finnish, uh, it might be also a Finnish uh, uh, discussion. <laughs> well, thank you very much. First of all, it's a, it's a big pleasure for me to be present, to have been invited. I feel really privileged and, and also to have the privilege of listening to criticism of, of, of the institution that I'm, I'm, I'm representing. Um, this question about drawing the right balance between privacy and um, uh, data protection on the one hand and then uh, transparency on the other, of course, is, is quite dif difficult and people have different views on on this. Uh, I'm sure also my former colleague Chris Doxy might have something to say later on, but my, <clears throat> my, my main uh, objective now was simply to make two small comments in relation to, to the two quite interesting introductions we just heard. My first <coughs> concerns what, what uh, Professor Trondal was calling double-hatted national administrations. All uh, national uh, agencies and, and bodies, of course, are in a certain way double-hatted because, as we all know, the implementation of, of EU law takes place pre predominantly at the national level. But, but what particularly interests me is this, I, I feel, increasing phenomenon of having specifically designated double-headed national agencies and, and units designated by union law. Uh, union law requiring that there must be this national entity taking care of this and this task and then defining those tasks, sometimes in, in detail, sometimes in very broad terms, and very often requiring independence of them in relation to the rest of the administration. Uh, a well-known example is competition, national competition authorities, but we have also the National Data Protection uh, Ombudsman. We have this in energy, in the energy market. We have this in telecoms. And I, I just recently had, a, had an oral hearing on, on the independence of the national officer that handles down slots for airports. You can imagine Heathrow uh, and the economic importance of having a slot uh, and, and, and there this national officer must be independent of the national uh, airport uh, authority, whatever is the status of, of that. And, and because these are requirements, at least partly of EU law, these questions also come before the, the European Court of Justice, either as preliminary rulings, uh, as this uh, Portuguese case on the slot, slot officer, uh, was a preliminary ruling, or as infringement procedures, commission versus member states, three member states have been condemned by, by the Court of Justice at the initiative of the commission for not having a data protection national uh, officer or, or institution uh, independent enough of the rest of the administration. Uh, these bodies, I suppose, must be under the jurisdiction uh, of the national uh, ombudsman, not of the European ombudsman, because these are basically national institutions, but with EU tasks. So you have a sort of interesting phenomenon where you have, have, on the one hand, the national ombudsman that probably should look into them if need be, 
and then at the EU level, the European Court of, of, of Justice. And I'm just wondering to what extent at the national level uh, this has been, let's say, sufficiently observed and, and, and there might be a specific task for national ombudsmen to think of this, that, that these are somehow even more double-hatted than some other agencies. And then my, my second remark, a very brief one, was, was to the introduction by Professor Ville. It was just the statistics uh, concerning the Court of Justice. You might wish to include also the General Court, which used to be the Court of First Instance, because if you look at the, at the figures of the General Court, which um, looks into cases brought by private uh, persons, including companies, if you have EU institution decisions, um, uh, then uh, uh, from having just a few hundred cases per year coming in last year, they had 900. So that the increase is much more uh, dramatic and uh, and the, the, the number of current cases is roughly 1,400 pending, whereas in, in my court uh, there are only 700. Uh, so so it's, it's the double. So if you take that into account, the, the overall increase for the court system is much bigger than, than, than your, your table might indicate. Thank you very much. Uh, if you agree, I would suggest to take on uh, other remarks and questions and have a final comment on your side. Thank you, Mr. Zilla. Um, I, I was very intrigued by the introductions uh, of, the, of uh, Trondel and Wiele, and uh, I, I would like to make one observation. It's the following, that um, uh, Mrs. Wiele uh, um, laid stress on the network and the cooperation of all the accountability institutions uh, within the European Union. And um, I, I think there's one thing intriguing, and that's the issue of uh, cooperation and interaction between those institutions. Um, uh, I've been working as an ombudsman, as a judge, and uh, now I am a member of the European Court of Auditors. And in my view, the, the, the way those institutions, and even Olaf or, uh, or the Parliament, they have their own discipline. And Mr. Zieler, you pointed on the issue of plural uh, uh, pluralism and interdisciplinary uh, an, an interdisciplinary approach and I think that the development of accountability in Europe is depending on the way in which those institutions from their own perspective from their own independent role they can interact with each other so I think if we we, we reflect on the, uh, the progress of accountability in Europe, it should be on the, uh, on the, 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 the cooperation of those institutions. But that also relates to uh, the issue of turbulence in the sense that I believe that this kind, these kinds of cooperation are very complex and, and very difficult to, uh, to perform because it's the most easiest way for, uh, for instance, the Court of Auditors to limit itself to financial control, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the presentation. I, I found it fascinating, and I come to this uh, as, as a novice, really. I don't know much about the, the, your framework of analysis. I have one comment and one question. The comment relates to the role of the ombudsman uh, um, I in relation to uh, EU agencies. It seems to me that uh, EU agencies have grown exponentially in recent years. Uh, they represent a new frontier of EU administration. We really have, to use the American terminology, we really have experienced the growth of a fourth headless branch of, of, of the state. They have enormous power. Um, so uh, I, I think that is, a, a, it, it is it inevitably appears to me to be that it is going to be a challenge for the ombudsman. Um, and also, perhaps to uh, link this with, with the, the, the with J J Judge uh, Rosas' um, point, uh, many of these agencies in the financial supervision area are also double-hatted, even though they're EU agencies. Uh, it is the reverse side of the double-hat, if you wish, because they're colleges of national supervisors. And uh, they, the way they 
the, both their remit and the way they go about performing their remit uh, appears to me to raise a number of profound questions about accountability. So this is really a, a, a reflection I would, I would be uh, very interested to um, have your, your, the reactions of the, of the authors on that. Um, um, the, the second is a question, and it relates to your framework of analysis. I am not familiar with the uh, a, a bibliography on turbulence. Um, and my question is this, the way you defined it, it, it was interesting, but the, the first question that sprang to my mind is, is there any administration which is not turbulent? Uh, if, if not, then what is the value of your, of your framework? There, there would still be, I can still see why you might be using that, that, that perspective, but it appears to me the way you defined it is you're looking for uh, decision makers who face um, <coughs> contradictory pressures, who need to reach a, an equilibrium, who need to draw balances, well, are, are not all decision makers, makers under, 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 under those pressures. Thank you. Two. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think one reason for for f stressing, as we're coming to, to the last uh, intervention first, one one why, why, uh, reason to to stress the agencyification, the role of agencies, is perhaps the, 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 that it has been as one part have been neglecting ne ne neglected in much literature, and that is reforms of the state. One major reform of the state during the last 20 years has been the agencification of the state. Okay, and then the question is why and with what consequences? In the, in the literature, the what consequences uh, question has been, there has been, been a lot of research on the consequences of accountability at national level, control, autonomy, but not in the context of uh, EU relationship. So that is what we stress here is that with this type of reforms of the state, it has certain consequences for how the new units at national level, which has been, there will be more of them with greater de degree of the autonomy. It, it changes the patterns of governing that they are involved in. And that has, has been neg fully neg neglected in this uh, uh, new public management literature. Um, that we see novel patterns of politics really emerging. And <coughs> that is interesting. And, uh, while in this context we, we, we call it also <coughs> turbulence and the question is always, well, can you falsify? Can you see patterns where there is nothing of this? Perhaps not is probably a, a continuum with more or less of it. Uh, the, cha the challenge, I think, is uh, with, uh, also the, the conceptual challenge is this terms of scale, which I think is, we, we haven't thought it's, it's uh, fully through. But it's, uh, I think it's, um, it's, um, it's one of those uh, concepts that might be interesting to follow, where, where local solutions, which are considered good, could be uh, you'd consider as huge problems for systems at the, on, on a broad scale. So what is considered as a good solution for coordination, good solution for accountability at one level, could be a big problem at another, another level, and how to reconcile this. Um, uh, Double-hatted agencies, well, uh, so that is what we have called these uh, agencies at national level. The question could be, do we see a double-hatted national ombudsman? What would that require? And Do we see it and what is the requirement? Requirement one, number one is, as we said, autonomy of national ombudsman. That they are autonomous and pro probably they are. So that's not uh, a big... Uh, Challenge. The question, second um, requirement is perhaps more challenging, and that is the capacity of the European Ombudsman as, to be a hub in, among all the national Ombudsmen. So that is the question, if the e uh, European um, Ombudsman has the capacity, administratively and so on, to be, um, to be the centre. Um, yeah, I think, yeah. So this is the, the turbulence of scale issue here is that we have a multi-level administration, but perhaps no multi-level accountability mechanism. Yeah, um, I must say that um, uh, Jarl and I are still uh, having uh, uh, troubles in, <laughs> what? 
Thomas, in finding the, 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 the good focus of this research, but uh, we think it's promising to uh, uh, connect this accountability landscape with this uh, turbulence of administrative uh, uh, order. And uh, um, the question is, what are the implications for the individual institutions? Uh, the, the, the focus we have is, of course, more of institutional change and not of uh, traditional accountability uh, um, uh, research, which is focusing on who is accountable to who uh, about what. Uh, so uh, we are more uh, focused on the capacity, the, what, is, um, what is evolving also, because we have a sort of a longitudinal uh, perspective on it. And uh, where uh, we started with a, a, a small set of uh, institutions and very limited kind of arrangements when it comes to accountability, we see this uh, a sort of booming with the uh, amount of ac executive bodies which have uh, been uh, grown and also with the accountability institutions. And I think, uh, Mr. Brennick, my thank you for the, uh, the suggestion because indeed the interaction is of course very important for uh, the accountability capacity, I think, uh, of uh, the EU and all, all those uh, landscapes. But um, it, it, there is uh, uh, actually a lot of conceptual kind of, uh, um, um, a, what is it, innovation in, in trying to get this uh, uh, into, a, into, a sh in, into a sort of perspective. Uh, because we, uh, there is not really a, a tradition of uh, looking at landscapes, looking at systems of accountability instead of only one accountability institution. We want to see how they uh, evolve together and work together and how this is changing.